The topic of this lecture is metric learning, and it's going to be building on some of the ideas that we presented earlier about linear dimensionality reduction. Um, we're also going to be looking mostly at linear approaches here, but um, we're going to start taking into account class structure as well, so the actual class of, of different data points. And this leads us into a new corner of the field known as, as metric learning. All right, the main objectives of this presentation will be um, to help you understand the Mahalanobis distance, which is the, probably the most important uh, class of distance metrics. And then we'll know how to apply uh, metric learning to a, a classification problem to get improved performance. All right, so here's a, an, just a real simple example to motivate why we might be interested in learning distance metrics. Um, and it involves uh, predicting heart attacks. So here we've got a table of attributes for different individuals with, with different um, at numerical attributes. So we've encoded gender as either zero or one. Um, we've uh, included the age as well, the, the individual's weight, which might be relevant to whether they're going to have a heart attack or not. And we've also included their, their income, right, which might or might not be relevant. Um, so uh, the, one thing to note about this this particular formulation is that all of these different attributes have wildly different scales, right? So um, income could differ widely by thousands, whereas weight is probably going to differ by tens at most, and age maybe by just 10 or so years. Gender is never going to differ by very much at all. So these attributes are all, um, they all have different scalings in this input space, but there's nothing in the data that would indicate that, right? So if we just throw our standard pattern recognition algorithms at this, our standard dimensionality reduction algorithms, uh, they might be unduly influenced by a feature like income, right, which is going to have very high variance relative to the others. So, um, and, and another related problem is that there may be correlations. So you can imagine as we add more features on there, there could be spurious correlations in the data set that make different um, attributes totally redundant with each other um, as well. So uh, what, particularly for nearest neighbor methods uh, and methods like that that rely on calculating distances within the attribute space, those are definitely going to be biased by the income attribute um, as opposed to some of the others that might actually be more relevant to the heart attack problem. So um, how do we solve this? Well, a traditional solution um, to resolving this might be to apply some sort of pre-processing strategy. We can e do normalization, uh, maybe standardize things so they have mean zero and standard deviation one. That's a fairly common approach. Um, and there are all sorts of pre-processing methods that we can apply. Um, but the intuition behind metric learning is that maybe if we incorporate some class information from our training set, we can do even better. And we can define distances in this space that are actually more relevant to the task at hand than um, we would if we simply relied on intrinsic properties of the data itself. All right, so um, to summarize, measuring distance is a really critical part of pattern recognition, and this is not just for local methods, too. This is for all sorts of parametric methods for uh, classification and regression. Um, until now, we've sort of been letting the uh, data itself define our, our distances, but um, it, there are challenges with this that we noted before. And additionally, recall that Euclidean distances are less meaningful in high dimensions anyway. So even if our data is perfectly isotropic and, and, and uh, uncorrelated with each other and all distances mean the same thing and all, along all attributes, um, those Euclidean distances are going to be less valuable to us as we start moving to high dimensions just because of the curious geometry of these high dimensional spaces. So how can we resolve this problem? Well, metric learning is based on the idea that we can define new distance metrics, uh, new rulers for measuring distance in higher dimensional spaces that are based on properties of the data itself. These are non-isotropic distances that uh, reflect some intrinsic structure in the data, right? So this uh, is a really elegant depiction of, of what we're talking about that involves moving from uh, Euclidean isotropic distances to a Mahalanobis distance metric. So um, on the left side, you see a data set of, I guess, six points. Um, they're here the data point's color represents their class. So you can see that the, the yellow points are all of, a, of one class and they're sort of distributed more or less along a line. And there are also a couple of, of points having different class values um, to the north and south of them. Um, note that if we're, if we're trying to classify the query point in the center um, and we want to enclose the entire training data set of yellow points, we have to look out far enough that we're actually, we, the end ball is encompassing all of our data um, including the, the blue and the, the red. So really what this suggests is that the, um, the, the Euclidean data, or the, I'm sorry, the Euclidean distance metric, which is the same in all directions, really doesn't reflect the class structure in the data that tends to be distributed along this, this line. So uh, Mahalanobis distance metric is m more akin to, uh, say, an ellipsoid. 
uh, and that's what's portrayed at the, in the panel at right. Um, here we're looking at a, a Mahalanobis distance, and here it, uh, the uh, end ball in this, in this Mahalanobis distance measure encloses all of the, the yellow points while avoiding the, the data points of different classes. So the, our, now our, our ruler in this space actually reflects the, the structure of the data. So how do you calculate a Mahalanobis distance? Well, we know how to calculate a Euclidean distance, right? It's just um, the square, basically the, the squared sum of, of differences, take the, the, or the sum of, of squared distances, and then take the square root. Um, the Mahalanobis distance metric is almost the same, except in there there's a, um, a po an inverse positive semi-definite matrix that I've um, indicated here with this sigma. So, the, and you may note an analogy with the, the covariance matrix from data sets that we've seen before, say in the, in the PCA lecture that, that preceded this one. And that's not an accident because actually you can easily use a covariance matrix here to, to whiten your data. Just take its inverse and scale all of the, the dimensions and correlations appropriately to basically uh, undo the covariance properties uh, of the original data set. And this gives, this whitens the data. It makes everything isotropic so that the distance we calculate will be uh, now uh, adequate with respect, it will reflect the, the correlations in sigma, the sigma matrix. It, you, one can easily show that this expression is actually equivalent to a linear pre-transformation of the data. So here um, we, we define the, uh, the, we define this, this matrix sigma as V transpose V and um, push it through some algebra and reveal on the, the bottom line there of the expression that it's actually equivalent to pre-multiplying all of our data by a new uh, basis V. So really what this means is that in order to calculate a Mahalanobis distance, we can just take some, trans some linear transformation of the data um, and then apply our Euclidean distance in that space and it's the same as the, the Mahalanobis distance metric. And note that you can calculate this decomposition for um, any positive semi-definite matrix, it's possible to decompose it into the, to the Vs as we've done here. So there's a, a natural relationship between the Mahalanobis distance metric, or this ellipsoidal distance, and the um, linear dimensionality reduction strategies that we've explored in, in previous lectures. All right, this leads me to the um, wild and woolly topic of metric learning, which is an area of a lot of active research. Um, most modern uh, metric learning research, that is, uh, work to, to learn these, these distance measures, uh, treat it as a convex optimization problem. So they uh, take a Mahalanobis distance and then have some constraints on that uh, based on the, the class structure in the data, such as uh, data points having similar class must be close together, data points having different class must be far apart, right? And then treat it as a, a, an optimization problem problem and apply techniques from operational research and, and other uh, disciplines in order to tune that Mahalanobis distance metric, that, that sigma matrix, um, to best separate the different classes. Right? And um, the, there are challenges there, of course, in keeping the, the matrix positive semi-definite, which it must be um, in order to be a valid Mahalanobis metric, but um, that's the part of the, the research that's going on. And there are lots of applications for this, which include computer vision, uh, information retrieval, where you could be looking in databases right, to find something that's similar to your query, uh, which could be expressed as an image or a, a document with a bunch of text, right, which would have potentially thousands of different word attributes, or in biometrics, you're looking at, at gene expression information, right? You could easily get data points of thousands or tens of thousands of attributes there. So it becomes important if you're doing similarity queries in those sorts of settings um, that you have an effective distance metric um, to, on which to, to do that query. So um, yeah, so this is the, the, the modern uh, topic of, of metric learning. And here are a couple examples of the different methods that have been proposed in the literature for learning these uh, distance metrics. Most of this, the, this list are uh, Mahalanobis distance metrics, or linear uh, uh, pre-transformations of the data. This list is from Ballet, Hubbard, and Seben et al. Um, and it simply uh, gives you some intuition for the, the breadth of different algorithms that are available to do metric learning. Now we're going to do, uh, we're going to put most of this aside uh, for now um, and instead talk about an oldie but a goodie. That is a classical approach for uh, metric learning that works in many cases um, and has the additional property that's pretty robust um, and, and reliable and, and pretty um, easy and cheap to, to implement. That is pretty um, simple to, to implement. Um, 
I think I, I mentioned this already uh, once before, the relationship with linear dimensionality reduction. Um, that is, if this pre linear pre-transformation is, um, it, uh, represents a subspace of the data, that is, the, the covariance matrix isn't full rank, or V has um, fewer uh, uh, columns than the, the full space of the data, then this actually equates to a dimensionality reduction. Um, and in, in that case, it's, it's akin to PCA or some of the other methods that we've shown previously, the only difference being that here, the, the dimensionality reduction is taking the class structure into account and trying to separate the different classes from each other. Okay, so here's our, our classical approach to uh, metric learning. And this is a, a method that dates back to uh, Fisher, I believe. It's multi-class discriminant analysis. It's a generalization of Fisher's linear discriminant to uh, the case where we have several different, like many different classes, up to k different classes in this case. So we start with our data set of, of data points that's labeled with, with up to k different values. Um, the idea is to learn a Mahalanobis distance metric that best separates these classes from each other, where we'll define uh, separation shortly. Um, the output of this procedure is a linear projection of the dimensionality up to k minus 1, right? So it will also reduce the dimensionality of our, of our input space. And um, I, like I said, if we just use a single, a 1D case with, with two classes, that's equivalent to Fisher's uh, linear discriminant analysis. All right, so here are some definitions to get us started. First, I'm going to define the class mean as the mean of all the data points having a certain class uh, label ascribed to them. So we have a class mean for each one of our k different classes. Um, we're also going to define scatter matrices to represent the spread of the data. Um, here, we define the within class scatter matrix in a fashion similar to the, the sample covariance matrix. So we're just looking at squared distances against the mean. Um, and we do that for each class independently. Uh, if you take the sum of all the within class scatter matrices, then you get the total within class scatter matrix for that data set. And here, I've, I've just represented this graphically on the right side as ellipsoids. So each ellipse here has its own, it represents data from a different class in our data set. And the um, within class scatter is represented by the blue lines, right? So that basically that measures how compact all of these different class distributions are, right? We're also going to define a, uh, a matrix uh, known as the between class scatter matrix, which measures how uh, well these different uh, ellipses are separated from each other. So we take the mean of the entire data set, that is mu, and um, look at the, the difference between that and the mean of all of the classes independently. So this is represented in the image by the green arrows that show the, the separation of the different ellipsoids. So we have two measures of scatter here, the within class scatter and the between class scatter. So if we want to improve the separation of the classes in our projected space, the idea is to come up with a projection that shrinks the within class scatter. That is, we want all of the class distributions to be as compact as possible in the projected representation. At the same time, we want to increase the between class scatter. We want the classes to be well separated from each other. Right? Um, and so how do, you, how do you define this? Well, we, we measure the determinant of the scatter matrices, which you can think of as a sort of a measure of, of volume in, in high dimensions for these positive uh, semi-definite matrices. So here's our objective. We find the projection V to maximize the ratio of these determinants. That is the ratio of the between class scatter over the within class scatter. We're trying to increase the numerator and decrease the denominator. This is known as the Rayleigh coefficient. Um, and there exist lots of, of uh, straightforward ways to, to calculate this. But um, the, probably the most common one is the, um, to simply solve this generalized eigenvalue problem where you have the within and between class scatter matrices on either sides of this expression and then the vector of, of eigenvectors, which is, or the, I'm sorry, the matrix of eigenvectors, which is V. Um, and then um, uh, eigenvalues represented here by lambda. So solving this generalized eigenvalue problem with uh, standard numerical software will give you the, the projection that best separates the classes according to that criterion that we established in the last slide. All right, so um, I want to close with a quick example of how this can actually be used in practice. Um, and so here we're going to look at uh, an application in automated image analysis. So we're looking at analysis of geologic images in particular. Um, this is work by Francis et al. Um, in Osiris of, of 2014. 
Um, the idea is to perform segmentation of images. You may be familiar with image segmentation problems. And here we're looking at, at basically clustering data points. But we want to cluster data points in a way that's, that's relevant to the task at hand, that is relevant to the geologic content of the images. So that we're going to assume that our data cloud is uh, made up of points which are vectors of pixel attributes, which might include color uh, attributes as well as texture attributes. Um, and the objective here is to learn a projection that improves the quality of our image segmentation. That is, we want some distance where, uh, or I'm sorry, we want some distance metric where distance in the, in the projected space represents a sort of geologic distance in the, uh, in the image space. So here's an example of what the automated clustering should look like. So here's uh, an example of our, a k-means clustering with just two clusters. You can see we have a rock outcrop on the, the left, and we've applied unsupervised clustering to that. And it nicely splits the image into two different classes at, at right. And this corresponds quite well with the geologist's uh, interpretation of the scene. And so we'd like to, to do this for, for all sorts of, of uh, outcrop images, but it doesn't always work. You can see that um, often the uh, pixel values themselves don't actually reflect the geologic content. So this is quite obvious in this image where we have fractures that are a lot darker than everything else, but they aren't, th so these fractures aren't necessarily geologically interesting. They don't correspond with the, the composition of the rock that we're trying to recover, but uh, k-means clustering is biased by the, the, uh, the values of those, those feature of those pixels, that is the extreme attributes, the extreme dark intensity of those pixels, right, which cause it to be very distant from everything else, so the fractures appear as their own cluster, right? We'd like to avoid that. We want some different distance metric that will allow the, the k-mean segmentation to overlook um, some of these incidental features like fractures and instead focus on the features that are most relevant, that is the color and texture cues that will tell us um, where composition is actually changing. So um, Francis et al. applied uh, the multi-class discriminant analysis to this problem. Um, and here you see a projection of data points from rock outcrops. Uh, this rock outcrop had three different classes. And you can see that the uh, MDA projection, that is the multi-class discriminant analysis, does a much better job of, uh, project of separating these classes than traditional PCA or indeed raw, uh, clustering on the, the raw feature space would. So um, by training on labeled examples from one image and then applying that distance metric to another image, we can actually teach the system how to perform clustering better in order to recover geologic classes as uh, part of the cluster. So here's a visual example on that image that I showed you before. Um, the fractures, uh, instead of getting their own cluster, after we uh, learn the distance metric appropriately, we can get the system to actually recover, autonomously recover the, the compositional differences in the rock and, uh, and avoid the, the um, fracture confusion. So this is just one of many examples where multi-class discriminant analysis can improve uh, unsupervised clustering. So this, this pre transformation that we've trained on label data can be used to improve a, a totally unsupervised clustering approach on future images. Okay, so a quick summary of uh, what we've covered in this lecture. Uh, we talked about Mahalanobis distance metrics, which are uh, sort of an ellipsoidal generalization of the Euclidean distance. It, applying them uh, or measuring Mahalanobis distance is equivalent to applying a linear transformation on the original data set. Um, Metric learning can outperform purely unsupervised dimensionality reduction by accounting for the, the structure of classes. And um, we've additionally shown uh, how multi-class discriminant analysis uh, is a, a particularly useful form of, of metric learning that can provide projections of dimensionality up to k minus 1, where k is the number of classes in your data set.